Hello, and welcome to another episode of BB's Finds. I'm Blake B. This is the only show on YouTube where a guy extemporaneously talks about his collections, uh, the history behind his collections, his history with the collections, while sitting in a closet shared with his wife. Um, my wife's clothes are behind me. Uh, not going to talk about those today. Going to just talk about some other stuff. Um, mentioned I talk extemporaneously here. I know I, I do listen to a lot of podcasts, some of which, um, you know, when I try new podcasts and things like that, some of them seem like they're studying a little too much. Um, it kind of takes away from the the fun of it. Um, so this is all off the top of my head, just based on <clears throat> based on what I know. Um, so bear with me if I make any errors in terms of years or things like that. Um, sometimes I sometimes I uh, get names wrong. Um, there's one video where I called. Um, Mark Frost, who created the Twin Peaks, I called him Robert Frost, and then I corrected myself later. Um, so today, um, today I'm talking about kind of a couple. I'm kind of splitting things up a little bit. So I've got um, some CDs. It's a CD video. Um, so I've got a couple different genres of stuff. So one of them is um, uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab CDs. Um, I've, I've acquired a small number of these. Um, these are all purchased, by the way, uh, secondhand thrift store. You can buy them directly from Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab, um, depending on the depending on how much they make uh, of a CD. But I think anywhere between nineteen to uh, you know nineteen ninety nine to like you know forty nine ninety nine for a multi CD set. Um, uh, mobile fidelity sound lab it's an audiophile thing um a higher quality higher quality record pressings they started out as a record company um and then they kind of went to cd where there's like a higher audio uh component in the cds as well um i really don't i i've mentioned this before but i really am not an audiophile by any means i like music i'm a music file um i i just don't have the ears to be an audiophile, I've got a pair of decent headphones. Um, you know, I like listening to things on the music on the on the headphones um, because you know it's more it's a more immersive experience. Um, but in terms of a stereo home stereo setup, it just it just isn't for me. It's not worth going out and spending the the money on it. Um, I know people that do, um, and I I understand why they do. Um, I just for me, it's just not a priority. I would rather just listen to the music, um, and, uh, enjoy the music without having to think about the best way to enjoy the music and drive myself nuts. Um, there's guys in, uh, Japan, even that, that install their own, um, energy, uh, uh, electricity poles, uh, for cleaner electricity, because they claim for whatever reason that the cleaner electricity makes the music sound better. Um, <clears throat> that's how far you can take it if you really want. Um, not me though. Uh, I, I just, again, I just like to listen to music. Um, I started collecting CDs probably around the time. Um, I would say probably right around the time MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice came to prominence. Um, those were my first two CDs, I believe. Um, uh, from then, uh, from then on, it sort of developed into, um, getting, um, getting, uh, CDs from Columbia, uh, Columbia house at the, the mail away thing where we pay, you know, a penny a CD and then they send you a CD every month and you just send it back. It was this whole thing in the nineties. That's how I got exposed to a lot of music. Um, I think the first couple of CDs I bought were like, uh, Grateful Dead, Soundgarden, um, The Doors, um, a lot of classic rock and a lot of like kind of nineties, earlier nineties, alternative rock. Um, and then from there we have like lo local CD stores and things like that. So I trade stuff in, um, for other stuff or just buy stuff outright from those things. Uh, started collecting probably used CDs. I've been, I've been on forever. Um, mainly these days it's just soundtracks, um, uh, you know, kind of obs more obscure heavy metal and hip hop, um, record or CDs as well. Um, not so much in terms of rock music. Um, I've kind of, I've kind of almost hit, it feels like I've almost hit pause on the rock music, unless there's something that's really sticking out. 
Um, I really don't. Uh, I really don't buy too much in the way of rock CDs. Folk CDs, I'll buy. Grateful Dead, I'll buy. You know, there's so many different Grateful Dead CDs in terms of like the bootlegs and things like that. Um, but Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs. Uh, <clears throat> anytime I find a uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs CD, it's a no-brainer purchase, especially if it's in a used context, if it's at a thrift store. Um, so the uh, again, the Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab actually comes. There's actually two different types of CDs. There's a, there's just the regular uh, audio file, the um, the uh, pretty pretty standard uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab CDs with a uh, silver stripe on top. Um, you can identify these pretty easily because they say original master recording. Um, some people call them. Some people who don't know that much about collecting music may may call them uh, original master recordings rather than. Uh, MFSL or MoFi or uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab type stuff. Um, I know there's a lot of people that collect jazz um, CDs that are MFSL uh, reissues and things like that. Um, uh, there's also, I talked about the silver, there's also a gold one. Um, there's a gold band version. And actually, the disc is gold as well. Some people say that... Um, some people say that the sound quality is actually better with a gold disc. I again, that's debatable. I don't know if there's any scientific proof of that. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what I got here. Um, kind of was was sharing these with some friends. Uh, at least one of these finds, my my most recent find. That's what kind of what prompted me to do this video. Um, um, there's also, by the way, there's also like I mentioned earlier. Uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs releases a bunch of LPs, um, including a series. I think it's a very limited uh, number of pressings called the uh, UHQR. Um, I've got one of them. Uh, they're they're limited and they're numbered and things like that. UHQR pressings. Um, there's like Pink Floyd. I think Dark Side of the Moon or the Wall. I can't remember which one, but that's a pretty coveted one. It's like hundreds, if not a couple thousands. Um, there's a there's a classical music one that I have the UHQR and then I've got pretty pretty run of the mill um, I've got maybe I would say six or seven different um, Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs uh, LP pressings um, uh, I think the the best one we've we've got in our collection my wife and I kind of share our record collection um, is Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs pressing she it was actually her record she bought it this was uh, some number of years ago uh, I think it was around 2003 kind of will tell you a little bit about how the market has changed since then she bought it for I think the sticker's still on there but it was a six dollar record at a used um, a used record store um, it's it's at least a 50 or 60 dollar record on a good day based on the condition it's in um, not the greatest not the greatest condition but it's not it's not so beat that you can't listen to it um I've got like a Zubin Meta Star Wars and sci-fi um, uh, like kind of soundtrack. Zubin Meta's uh, con conductor. Um, I've got uh, a Carmina Burana, which is the uh, kind of very famous like operatic classical music. Um, I got an LP of that as well. Um, I'm trying to think what else I got. Um uh, Gordon Lightfoot, <laughs> Fleetwood Mac. Uh, those are just kind of picked up uh, from thrift stores. And then I got a Jethro Toll Aqualung, which I got from a record store probably around 2004 or five. Um, I, I saw it for like five bucks. I was like, yeah. And it's it's probably like, you know, on a good day, it's a 60 or $70 record. Um, okay, so let's get into it. So this is what uh, prompted me to do uh, the um, MFSL uh, CDs is I found uh, a copy of uh, Alan Parsons project I robot um, Alan Parsons does a lot of uh, he, he's actually not a, not a musician per se it's sort of a misnomer that he's like a band leader um, he's more of a <clears throat> he's more of a producer um, produced dark side of the moon kind of coincidental I would keep bringing that up again over and over uh, in this video um, but yeah a lot of a lot of his stuff is very conceptual um, I I uh, Stumbled upon him, I think through a friend who who recommended um, Tales of Mystery and Imagination, which is a which is a record that's uh, thematically based on um, thematically based on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Tale uh, of Ed Tales of Edgar Allan Poe. 
there's like a song about the Raven, um, <clears throat> Cask of on on Auto, um, a few other things. So we've got uh, I Robot, which is a <clears throat> classic uh, Asimov tale. Um, this is all music, kind of based on that story. Um, it's really good, very well produced. Um, Alan Parsons really knows his way around the board. Um, uh, up next, we have a, a Sarah Vaughn, uh, classic jazz singer. Um, nothing very ex- ex- exciting, um, but you know it's uh, it's uh, still fun to listen to. Um, I think she'd probably put her in the top five uh, jazz singers of all time. Uh, Grateful Dead songs from the Mars Hotel. Everyone knows me. Lo- knows I like the Grateful Dead. Um, this is uh, not their best album, but there's there are a couple of good songs on here. Um, I like Scarlet Begonias. I think most people know that from um, the uh, Sublime cover of Scarlet Begonias on the uh, 40 Ounces to Freedom album. Um, not a huge fan of Sublime, um, but uh, they they do have some love for the dead, so that's some, something to be said. Um, next up, we have uh, Bernard Herrmann. Uh, fantasy film world of Bernard Herrmann. Uh, Herman, um, Journey to the Center of the Earth, uh, Voyage of Sinbad, Day of the Earth Stood Still, and Fahrenheit 451. So he's got s- kind of a sampler. This is a this is the gold disc version. It's a little bit scratched up, but it's still playable, still enjoyable. Um, speaking of Bernard Herman, we also have the Vertigo soundtrack. This is an awesome soundtrack. Uh, the classic Alfred Hitchcock film, uh, starring, um, uh, what's his name? Cary Grant or Jimmy Stewart. Can't remember. Shoot. (laughs) Here we go. Extemporaneous. Um, I should be, I should have my film buff card revoked for that. Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart. It's gotta be Jimmy Stewart. Um, it's Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I need to read a little bit more on Hitchcock, apparently. But, yeah, it's a great soundtrack. Um, the uh, uh, fun movie to watch as well. We've got a poster. I think we don't have very many movie posters. Right? One of them is Vertigo. Um, my wife has a, a deep appreciation of Alfred Hitchcock um, that I, I can't even... It's not even on par with where I'm at with it. I just enjoy the films um, like Psycho and North by Northwest. And he's just got so much stuff. But Vertigo soundtrack is really great. Bernard Herrmann. Um, I know uh, uh, John Williams, when I saw him a few years ago, play at the Hollywood Bowl. They did uh, kind of a suite or like a three or four songs tribute to uh, Bernard Herrmann. It was, it was great. So anytime I see Bernard Herrmann stuff, usually um, usually I'll pick it up as well. That's pretty much it for my, my MFSL CDs. Um, there's a pretty limited number that I have. Um, next up, um, I wanted to talk about another genre of CD that I collect, and those are Disneyland related CDs. Um, so we will uh, let's kick it off with this one first. Um, this is the the official album of the Walt Disney World Resort. This is Walt Disney World. There's a lot of stuff on here that has to do with the all the different parks. Um, that are in Orlando, Florida. So there's some stuff that, it, you know, being a Californian and growing up, going to Disneyland, there's a lot of things that I don't quite recognize. Um, I have been to uh, Epcot once uh, when I was very young, um, but there's a lot of Disney MGM Studios and Animal Kingdom stuff on here, um, uh, along with the uh, the World uh, Disney World stuff. Um, but a lot of this, a lot of it's, you know, very familiar music in terms of, you know, the rides that, are at both parks, Disneyland and Disney World. Um, like, it's a small world. Um, we got uh, some Star Tours stuff on here as well. Um, the Some of the Space Mountain music. Um, Splash Mountain music. Um, let's see what else. The, um, the Tiki Room, which is a, it's a Stone Cold classic. Um, love that place, the Tiki Room. Uh Go, looking forward for Disneyland to reopen, and the, I am going back to the Tiki Room, um, along with Yoho, uh, which is the the pirate song from Pirates of the Car- Caribbean. 
um, in both located in both uh, Disney World and Disneyland. Um, it's a so this is a pretty pretty dense um, uh, collection. It's, uh, about fifty or so songs to celebrate the fiftieth year uh, of the Disney World Resort. Um, yeah, this is I I don't know you know I think this is pretty rare. I don't see many Disneyland CDs. Anytime I do, I, I just pick them up. Um, thrift store again. Uh, next up we have um, Main Street Electrical Parade. This is a CD. It's a single. There's actually two tracks on it. This was released in 1999 by Walt Disney Records. Um, there's a clear. It's a clear disc. Um, there's some art, and then underneath the art is the, the actual music itself. But the Main Street Electrical Parade was a was a parade that ran for many years at Disneyland, um, featuring lights, floats, and lights at nighttime. Uh, I actually prefer it over the fireworks show that they that they put together. As much as I do like enjoy the watching the fireworks show and Tinkerbell and everything, I do like the Main Street Electrical Parade. Um, just reminds me of a, a time when. Um, Maybe Disneyland wasn't overthinking. Um, I think they try to do a little bit too much with the uh, character immersion and things like that, with the with theme themes and things like that. I think the electrical parade is not so much of a tie-in, but more of just a celebration of Disneyland, which is kind of why I like it. Um, but it's got a lot of samples from different um, uh, some from different Disney properties, um, kind of classic Disney properties. Uh, it's it's real fun to listen to the 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 cut the the original version cut on here is 11 minutes and six seconds long which is about probably the same length as the parade um was they did bring back the parade for a time um sort of a revival style um brought back the parade to disneyland i don't know if they're still running it obviously they're not running it right now but uh prior to the park closing um due to uh the state of the world uh, but yeah, this, the main street, there's an orchestral version on this second, uh, second track here, which is, which is fun as well. Um, CD single of main street electrical parade. Um, I, I do like to buy if, if I can find them CDs re- related to certain rides. Uh, I know star tours does not have one. I mean, many rides don't have much, many songs, but there is one ride that does have a lot of stuff. And that is the Haunted Mansion. I actually have two copies of this one. The Haunted Mansion. Um, there's a 30th, 30th anniversary version. Uh, these are both released by Red Red Dot Net. Um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, the, this compiles. Both of them compiles the. Uh, the Haunted Mansion attractions at Disney World, Tokyo Disneyland, and the Phantom Manor at Disneyland Paris, which is similar to the Haunted Mansion, um, basically, in, in concept. Um, there's some alternate music and narrations on here, original radio ads, sound effects, and outtakes. There's a pretty strong like Haunted Mansion culture just in general. There, you know, I've got a Haunted Mansion art book. Um, there, there's, there's kind of a society of people that... I've seen they release like these like kind of like almost like bootleg type DVDs about different rides at Disneyland. And I think the Haunted Mansion one was like two or three discs. There's a lot to be said about that ride. I mean, it's uh, th- I think that there's some like mythology and lore that kind of goes deeper than than most park goers would know about riding the rides. Um, one of my cousins actually worked for Disneyland for a time and was kind of telling us about the tie-ins between the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and the Haunted Mansion ride and said they kind of, they, they're connected through some sort of backstory. Um, it, it, so I'm still trying to, trying to piece it together in my mind. Maybe I'll have to do a little bit more reading on that, but um, I do like the Haunted Mansion. I was scared of it when I was a kid, um, but I appreciate it now because it's it, the, the, it's not really scary so much as it is kind of goofy fun. Um which is kind of what Disneyland's all about. Um, so those are the two Haunted Mansion um, CDs I have. I've also got a Haunted Mansion uh, LP downstairs. One of the, I think it was like a 1960s or 1970s pressing of it. Um, I've got, next up we have a Disneyland official album 
of the park. So this is this is actually fun because it's got all the classic rides, um, and including some like some like background stuff like Main Street Station, the the train call, you know, all aboard. Um, but you got the Enchanted Tiki Room, uh, some Indiana Jones adventure stuff, Temple of the Forbidden Eye. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, Grim Grinning Ghosts from Haunted Mansion, uh, Splash Mountain, Splash Mountain song. Splash Mountain's actually getting a, um, it's getting a facelift, um, so to speak, uh, in, because of the almost like insensitive nature, I guess you could call it, of the ride. I always, you know, probably once a year, I'm like, kind of like listening to these CDs or, you know, I ask my wife, what? why is that a ride? Why is that a ride? Uh, song of the South was what it was based on. And, um, you can't even buy a, uh, a legal, uh, DVD copy or a VHS copy of song of the South, uh, in the United States currently. Um, it's been banned, um, for, for some reasons that, you know, insensitive to, uh, some of the things that are going on in America currently. So, um, it's just a little interesting that the, uh, they're going to try to revise it to something else, but that's fine. You know, I'm cool with that. Um, Fantasmic, uh, which is the one of the shows that they have, like light and water show, I believe, um, on the Rivers of America. Uh, Frontierland, um, all aboard the mine train. We know what the mine train is. Big uh, Thunder Mountain, one of the best, uh, one of the best rides in the park. The uh, classic um, mine cart or their mine train roller coaster ride. Uh, Fantasyland, it's a small world. Everyone knows that one. Um, then we've got um, some Star Tours music. Along, I think there's some like bulletins and things that they will say inside of Star Tours. So there's a lot of sounds that beyond just the music, there's a lot of sounds that are very familiar to, with visiting Disneyland on the CD. Um, it kind of just makes me want to go to the park. Um, there's Space Mountain. They've revamped Space Mountain a number of times. Um, I remember it, probably the first time I wrote it, it wasn't as... Uh, robust as it is in terms of the 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 auditory experience um the music and things like that but they've really um they've really ramped it up in terms of how um people can experience it beyond just riding the ride but you know all the little things throughout throughout waiting in line and hearing hearing these different sounds and things like that so it's very reminiscent of visiting the visiting that ride as well um then there's a fireworks spectacular which is uh the tinkerbell flying from the top of Matterhorn Mountain to the kingdom, um, to the castle rather, uh, Sleeping Beauty's castle. Um, so it's, it's a good lesson. The kids really like this one too. So, um, uh, next up we have a Disney related, Disneyland related is the, the Sherman brothers, uh, songbook. This is a, a recent acquisition for me. Um, but this is a pretty, this, it, these are all on Walt Disney records, by the way, the last, uh, well, the last one in this one. Yeah. Walt Disney records. Main Street Parade, same. Yeah. The only ones that are on this uh, red dot net are the the um, Honda Mansion records. Sherman Brothers. Okay. Sherman Brothers are probably best known for their uh, writing of Disney songs or Disney-related songs, uh, Mary Poppins, namely. Um, they also released um, some stuff from, like, The Parent Trap and um, some stuff from um, – uh, some other Disney movies. Uh, they, they did the Tiki Room. These are the guys that did the Tiki Room uh, songs. Um, it's very iconic, very classic stuff. Um, Winnie the Pooh, a lot of Winnie the Pooh stuff, Jungle Book stuff. Um, then they also did the um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. <laughs> I laugh because it's um, almost like those Mary Poppins. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. Not only do they have actors in common, um, but thematically the movies are kind of similar. Um, kids go on a fantastical adventure with a grown-up companion. Uh, I I would say that uh, for all three of those movies. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of ironic that they they kind of fell into uh, almost like a almost like a pattern or like almost like a template for for writing these songs. It was pretty probably pretty. Um, easy for them by the time they got to the third one um mary poppins came first of course and then with the success of mary poppins came Chitty Chitty bang bang and uh um bed Ops and broomsticks there's also some rides or there's also some songs here from from rides um like the journey to imagination from epcot they did the music too um 
Meet the World from the Tokyo Disneyland uh, uh, Park. Um, then they, they have some uh, some other just kind of interesting things like The Happiest Millionaire, That Darn Cat, you know, some of the more like 60s live action type Disney films that I don't know if they get as much um, replay these days, but maybe because of Disney Plus they do. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, I, I do know like every once in a while I kind of have a hankering to watch those movies, you know, like Flubber and um, old, you know, just kind of older Disney live action stuff. Um, Sherman Brothers are great. Um, I think they were kind of memorialized in that Saving Mr. Banks movie, which I haven't seen. Um, probably should see that sometime soon. But they, when they were, uh, when Walt Disney was um, kind of negotiating with P.L. Travers, the the author of the Mary Poppins book, on how to make um, a Mary Poppins movie. Uh, you know, how her vision, how he wanted to make it a certain way, her vision, and then the Sherman brothers were the ones that did the music and everything. I think it turned out really well. I mean, Mary Poppins is a classic. Okay, so that's pretty much it for my Disneyland type stuff. I do have a couple Disney related. Um, just want to sneak these in here. Yeah, it's to get to a couple more minutes on the video, but, um, so Star Wars soundtracks. Let's talk about Star Wars soundtracks. When Star Wars soundtracks were first released, um, in well, at least the first two movies, CDs weren't around. Um, so the movies, the soundtracks were released on vinyl, um, LP form, and cassette form as well. Um, so Star Wars soundtrack was you know fairly limited to, to selections from the movie, not the whole full Monty in terms of the the. Music that might be a little shorter uh, in scenes that, you know, it was, it was mainly focused on the bigger things that more recognizable things. Um, in, uh, in or around um, 97, when they did the special edition, they released these, uh, these CDs. So these are multi-disc um, CDs from uh, Star Wars soundtrack released by Lucasfilm and 20th Century Fox and uh, RCA Victor. Um, so this is more, a more robust, um, uh, almost like collection of music from Star Wars. There's a lot of things that aren't on the original LP pressing that, that, you know, a lot of background music and things like that, that, um, it's just stuff that's very familiar, like be from watching the movies, but stuff that I, you know, you haven't really heard up until these were released. Um, there's a lot of unreleased tracks on here, previously unreleased and unreleased tracks. Um, so there's some stuff that John Williams did uh, for the movies that, you know, weren't on the original soundtrack or aren't in the movie. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, Empire Strikes Back. This is a uh, same deal. It's a two disc set, um, but it's got a lot of the, I mean, Empire probably has, I would say, probably better music than Star Star Wars A New Hope just because there's a more wider range of emotions going on in the film um, because of kind of the roller coaster concepts going on um, so there's I think there's more range in terms of just emotion and in, in music um, but there's again there's there's some unreleased stuff on here uh, very iconic um, you know like the Imperial March obviously is is like the the number one from this this album but there's a lot of stuff with the uh, you know when when they're when they're trying to escape, uh, Han Solo and Princess Leia and Chewbacca and the droids are trying to escape the um, the Imperial forces that are chasing them and going into asteroid field and things like that and um, a lot of stuff with Bespin and Dagobah. Um, it's just it's it's just fun. Listen, I'd I'd probably prefer this over the Star Wars A New Hope, although. From from time to time, Star Wars: A New Hope does hit the spot, and then uh, we have Return of the Jedi. This has a different cover. Um, yeah, it's still released in '97 though. It doesn't have the special edition, um, kind of like like bronze and silver and gold or whatever they were going for with that. But Return of the Jedi, um, it's got some it's got some more fun songs on it because of the Jabba's Palace stuff and because of um, including Jedi Rocks, unfortunately. <laughs> I like the original. This does have the original uh, um, Jabba Palace songs, I think. Yeah, it does have the original Jabba Palace songs. Um, 
but then it also has a special edition, the Jedi Rocks, which is like this big kind of a boisterous, like rock and roll performance done by these people, the alien kind of people that live in there that reside in Jabba's palace. Um, it's got the Ewok song as well. Um, it doesn't have the original. I don't think it has the original Ewok song, which is kind of a bummer. I don't know if that's even been released. Um, also known as the Yub Yub song. Um, one of my favorites from when I was a kid. Special edition kind of changed things because they, they took that whole ending scene uh, with the with the Ewok Yub Yub song and they made it into something that was more... Um, it's almost almost like new agey, new age type music, and they almost like a, I don't know, it's like kind of tribal sounding stuff, and then they would show different parts of the galaxy celebrating the, the fall of the empire. Little did they know the empire would be back in the form of the first order, some number of years later. But that's that's pretty much it for my video. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, again, this is these are all my. Disney related CDs, mostly Disneyland and um, Star Wars. And then uh, I got my Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab CDs as well. Uh, hope you're well and take care. See ya.